I can't just run around and go completely insane with crazy ideas and, yeah. you know, because what happens is, as you can tell, people just like go white in the face and they're like, oh, where do we go? How do we start? What That's are we gonna step do? One, right? Yeah. There are so many things I can't control, but the things that I can. The Dick Polipnik Show. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Online Growth Systems. I'm your host, Dick Plipnik, and today we have a special guest, Chris Lindahl. Chris, thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Awesome. So Chris is the CEO most commonly known for Chris Lindahl Real Estate. You may have seen his billboards all over Minnesota or frankly in other states too, right? Yeah, yeah that's right. Uh, he's in Philadelphia. He's all over. Uh, you might have heard him on the radio. He's getting some buses and some trains wrapped. Uh, by the time we release it, it'll probably be yeah. everywhere, right? That's right, yeah. yeah. So uh, he is an expert on branding, he's an expert on marketing, and he's an expert at taking traditional industries, applying a system, and getting it to a point where other entrepreneurs can get involved and have a system in place, almost like a, what McDonald's did for burgers, uh, Chris is doing for real estate. Would that be accurate? I don't know, that feels like a lot. I mean, that feels like a lot of pressure I've got to live up to now. That's right. Now, <laughs> now you got to relay all that pressure to the audience. Wow, this so. will be tough. Awesome, so let's just kind of dive into yeah. your story. How did you get yeah. started? I got my real estate license in, in 2009, um, which arguably for most would say that was the most challenging time in our economy and, and in real it. estate, yeah. yeah. Um, but looking back, it was actually the best thing that ever happened to me. I was fortunate to see a lot of other real estate agents and brokers and teams and, and really anyone associated with the real estate industry mm -hmm. really struggle and lose a lot, live beyond their means. You know, not really sure how to adapt to a change in economy. So when I got my license, you know, really the only business that was transacting were short sales and foreclosures. So I started doing short sales and I be quickly became the number one short sale agent in the state. You know, at any given time, I was negotiating like 80 to 100 short sales at a time, wow. and, which is absolutely significant. Well, what's interesting about that is most of the agents had just came from a really good economy, 2005, 2006, where things were selling for crazy amounts of money. It was insane. And so a lot of the agents and teams and brokers had no interest in doing a short sale or any part of a foreclosure. Right. And I didn't know any different. Yeah, yeah, and I didn't know any different because like that process takes six to eight months to close. Right. And half of them fall apart. Mm -hmm. And you know, you're calling the bank every week, which there's no emotion, right? It's just a total business transaction. Mm -hmm. You have people that are going through tough challenges in their life. I mean, you know, death, divorce, job loss, bankruptcy really tough stuff. It was a great learning opportunity for me and really it taught me a lot about myself and, and how to put yourself in really sad negative environments all day, every day and bring some positivity by negotiating these short sales and getting people from underneath a lot of this debt and, and helping them move on with their life. And now we're fortunate enough to work with a lot of them now that they've recovered and they're in a better spot. And yeah. they're super loyal to you because you helped them when they were in a hard spot now that they're doing yeah. financially much better off. They're like, hey, I'm working with Chris. No That's questions right. asked. And you know, and, and what's so interesting about the whole thing, the market is, you know, the economy's good. Economy's good. What a lot of people say, and, and you hear this about companies that get really successful, it's like, oh, what is that company going to be able to do in the downturn? Mm -hmm. Right? Everyone always says that. Like, yeah. you look at any company that's super successful, people always poke holes in it and say, what's that gonna look like in the downturn? And the downturn doesn't scare me, because I, I started in the downturn. When you're building a brand and people are really aware of who you are, and you have a really strong brand, you actually grow in a downturn. And that's what I think a lot of people right. don't understand. Big market share is gained in the downturn when others pull back, are struggling, and don't want to invest when times get tough. Right, that's and, when there's know, the most opportunity. Always, and you know, and, and, and you know, we're fortunate enough to be in a really good cash position within our organization mm -hmm. where we're gonna to continue to get more aggressive as the market starts to shift because it's already shifting, which just benefits our clients even more. Mm -hmm. So what are your, speaking of like economic downturn, do you have any predictions as far as that market goes or what do you think the reality is going to yeah. be? If I did, I don't know that I'd be here, right? I mean, it's right. kind of like having a magic eight ball. I mean, you know, right. interest rates are, are, you know, are fluctuating. They've been sort of trending down a little bit as of lately, but you know, I, I really don't know. But what I do know is I know that we've built a system that, you know, we can help homeowners and home buyers in a completely different way mm -hmm. through an innovative approach, whether the market's down or up. because. 
I started when it was down and there's always opportunity and there's always places where you can capitalize and, to, and take advantage. And so that environment for me doesn't, is what I'm looking most forward to. Whereas most people are scared of like change and downturn and innovation and technology and like a competitive market and competitive environment is a great thing, right? Mm -hmm. Like to have choices. And so we're, we're super excited for it. And we continue to position ourselves in a way where we will win. Right, right. So let's, let's dial, dial it back to your origin story. So you got your real estate license, your broker's license in 2009. Yes, yeah, so I got my real estate agent license got it. in 2009. Got it. So which company were you with in 2009? I was with a, a, a local uh, independent brokerage at the time. Got it. Um, and then in 2014, I, I joined a national franchise. And then last year in May, so May of 2018, mm -hmm. um, we started our own independent brokerage, Chris Lindahl Real Estate. Got it. So what was the decision making that motivated you to go from private firm or small local firm to a franchised firm to doing your own thing? At the time, you know, the, the first company I was with, it, I was a little bit ahead of my time in, in terms of forming a team. Mm -hmm. So in terms of forming, forming a team, like I didn't have any, I didn't have a blueprint. I didn't mm -hmm. have any support. I didn't have anyone to mentor me on how to create that team. Right. And so when I went into... Uh, the second system, the second company, I started to meet people within that organization throughout the country that had sort of started flirting around with the idea of creating a team. Right. And so I started building some really strong relationships nationally. Uh, and, and we would, you know, have masterminds and throw ideas together. And, yeah. you know, I'd learn from them. They'd learn from me. And so really the community nationally was, was very helpful. But what quickly became is we created such a strong brand here that it didn't make sense for us to give any sort of credit to another brokerage, whether whatever company that or brand that is, mm -hmm. it just didn't make, make sense to split the branding with, with any company other than our own. Right. Um, I love a lot of people at my previous organization and, and uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity and I love watching them continue to succeed, but it just made a lot of sense for us to step into our own lane because we were the ones taking all the risk on the advertising and the marketing. It just didn't make sense for another entity to benefit from it. Right. And most people, when they think of doing a business deal with you, doing it, let's say they want to list their house for sale, they want to get a guaranteed offer. They don't think, oh, I'm going to go with uh, Remax. I'm going to, they think, oh, Chris, Chris is my guy, yeah. right? So they were already associating your brand with you, not with the company name, right? Yeah. So that's, what's interesting about, you know, the, the number one question I get all the time is, you know, when, when someone reaches out to you, don't they always want Chris? Like that's what everyone always asks. Right. And so, but when you build your brand around a personality, People in today's day and age want to associate the business they're doing with a person. Yep. Right? So it's like, if you think about, you know, anyone that's watching this that thinks about a real estate agent that they've had interaction with or that they've worked with, they never say the brokerage name. They always say the agent name. Right. And I started to learn that over time. Like, hey, no one ever credits the broker. They credit the person that they have a connection with. Right. And so if we can create a brand in marketing where human beings can have a connection with me as sort of the front facing you know, personality of the organization, right. like that gets really interesting. Right. And so you ever, if you ever notice, no one ever says anything on social media about Chris Lindahl real estate, they talk about Chris. Mm -hmm. And I watched that happen over the years and so that's why we made the transition that we did. Right, so here's a devil's advocate kind of question. A lot of entrepreneurs, they start with the end in mind, right? They, their goal is, oh, I wanna get acquired, I wanna build up this large company. So with a name like Chris Lindahl Real Estate, it's going to be hard for you to exit out of that someday. Do you think so? Logically, right? Do you think so? I mean, arguably, like if, unless you were like sticking with it so, to the so day you die. So let me give you a couple right? examples that come off the top. Henry Ford. Sure. Right? Morgan Stanley. There you go. Like, I mean, so there, there, I mean, there's ton, tons of examples, right? But right. those are just a few. I mean, Warner Stallion, local company, right. right? So there are so many that are associated with the name. Right. And, and so I'm not worried about that. And, and honestly, I have no intention of being acquired or selling this company. Like we are literally at the ground level mm -hmm. of changing the way that real estate's conducted. And I love what I do and I love the people in our organization. I love their families. Right. And I love the community of the, the clients, the past clients and the supporters that we have. Like this right. is my dream and I'm living it. And you think of like famous, uh, whether it's a methodology or a mindset or a business model, frequently they're named after the person that started it, right? Like if you think of uh, even like psychologists, right? Like they are a common like a thought that they had or an idea or a theory is named after them, right? Um, so sometimes like even if you think of like Ford, he started, 
you know, Ford Motors, right? right? His name has lived on, it's a legacy. Of course. So what you're probably building here is, it, it goes beyond you. 100%. This could be a hundreds of years company and it's gonna live past you. It's gonna be something that's a brand that stands the test of time. And you're using your motivation, your personality, your brand right now to get it off the ground floor and it, to a point where it'll be at a legacy state where that, that shit won't matter. That's, that's right, yeah. Right. And, and, and I, mean, I mean, Disney's another one that comes to mind, right? Exactly. I mean, Disney's another one that comes to mind. And, right, it's a and, and, so, and, and we're, we're so focused on, on listening to the consumer and building that world-class service yeah. um, that you're absolutely right. Like, I am such a small part of our organization at this point. We have so many intelligent people in our organization that work mm -hmm. so hard yeah. uh, and are committed every single day that what happens is the organization starts to take a life of its own when you really build a solid foundation like we have with our brand. I, I'm just honored to be even in the room with, I mean, there's a lot of people in this organization that are a lot smarter than I am. Right, right, and that's what the smartest entrepreneurs do though, right, is uh -huh. they surround themselves with people who are smarter than them. I exploit that, like behind the camera here, people can't see it, but I got Jeff, right? He's my yeah. main video guy. He knows equipment like the back of his hand, right? Of course, yeah. So it's, it's finding those people to fill your weaknesses with your where you don't have a strength, of right? Of course, yeah. So maximizing your efficiency. Where you shine is brand. Where you shine is personality. Where you shine is that relationship building, camaraderie. What you said earlier, building a team. You didn't have a mentor in that because it was a newer concept of like, how do I build a team behind me that can support me and propel us as a group to success, right? Yeah, what's interesting is, you know, uh, Building a team, I mean, there's, you know, I know you have an audience of all across the board, really. Right. People just getting started out all the way up to experience, you know, C-level executive. And what's interesting is building a team sounds a lot easier than it is. I made so many mistakes along the way. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I think too often what happens is, you know, people might compare themselves to where they are today to what our company looks like today. Mm -hmm. But there were so many challenges and mistakes and bad decisions that I made along the way mm -hmm. um, that led us to where we are today. And I think too often we compare ourselves to someone's social media appearance, right? Like mm -hmm. it all looks rosy, like they've got this successful company. Right, it's that, highlight reel. It's right, and the challenges don't go away. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I mean, it, it, as we grow, we still have challenges uh, all the time. We have less of them and they're more predictable now because yeah. we've made a lot of them before right. and we try not to make the same mistake twice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So l let's talk about some of those mistakes you made yeah. building your team because there might be someone listening right now who, myself included, I'm building a team right now and I selfishly, I'm curious because maybe you've learned something through your mistakes and that I can learn from. So what are some things that were really difficult for you when you were building that team? What yeah. did you learn and how did you fix it? Yeah, that's good. Um, hiring, hiring was a really tough thing for yeah. me. Um, you know, I, I, mean, I'm a, I mean, when you look at any personality assessment, I'm the most extreme visionary off the charts on anything that any, right. as high as you can score visionary, which is good right. and bad, right? I've got some weaknesses because of that, mm -hmm. but I see the best in everyone and I think I can help everyone. Mm -hmm. And so I'll hire people wanting the best for them, thinking I can help them when they don't have the motivation. Right. And they don't want to get out of bed. Right. And, and like they, they can't get up and they don't even want it themselves. Yeah. I want it more than they want it. And so early, for them. Yeah, yeah, correct. <laughs> and so early on what was happening was I was hiring people and I wanted it so bad for them. I wanted to a point where they just, they couldn't do it. They, they, they didn't have it in them. Right. And, and it was super frustrating for me. Uh, it was hard on me because I was so used to like, I wanna inspire them, I wanna help them, I wanna educate them, I wanna do whatever I can yeah. to watch them grow and not make the same mistakes that I made when I was a real estate agent. That's the toughest one because I think when you're early on, what happens is, you know, you might be doing all the hiring, right? right. So you're meeting someone and you know, you're just like, you want the best for them and, and you're hiring off gut instinct. Yeah. I mean, there's no assessments, there's no core values, yep. there's no metrics, you're not measuring, them. there's no KPIs. Yeah. So over time, what, what happened is like, okay, I think we need to start assessing people, right? Like we need to figure out like, you know, what is their motivation? What is their background? Like, were they in the military? Do they have team sports background? Like, what are the things that they did before? Let's start like looking at the organization we have now and we and let's like look at what what our most successful people let's look at their profile and start hiring to that. Right. They've figured out how to be really successful in our organization and the way that we built it. Why try to complicate this? Why don't we just find out how to get more people like that? Right. right. And so that's what we did. But 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 it took so long because if you put me in a room with someone, I will see the best for them every single time. Right. And sometimes they don't want it, and it's frustrating. And it's heartbreaking and. Mm -hmm. I've had some really good friends that I've had to let go over the years that just don't want it. Right. They don't have that firepower. Like, and I would say that's the, the biggest mistake 
the other one too is, is the one that I know a lot of people watch and probably go through. Instead of explaining how to do it, you just do it. Right? Like, oh, it's going to take me too long to explain. I'll just do it. If you want it done like, right, yeah, do it yourself. Right, right, yeah. And so you end up doing everything, right? So, yeah, it maybe takes you five minutes instead of explaining it, which would take 10. The challenge is, is you're doing the five minutes every single time yeah. where they could be taking that from you. And so now our big motto is, is that we're solving for the future, not for today. Mm -hmm. So nothing that we do in the organization is, is solving for now. Mm -hmm. We're solving for the next level, for the next change, for the next thing. So that when we get to that next level, we've already got it solved. Mm -hmm. We're not solving for what's in front of us because if you solve what's in front of you, you're behind, mm -hmm. right? So we're, we're always going in the future like, okay, if we bring someone on, the first thing we do is, okay, you're gonna document this entire thing that you do. Mm -hmm. Everything that you're building right now that you're doing in your job, we are going to document that so that when you step up as a leader and someone else comes behind you, Replaces we are, that that's position. right, and totally. They have a blueprint ready for them. And, and the other, you know, I mean, there's, there's so many challenges, I've, you know, and mistakes that I've made along the way and challenges I've faced. But another one is not having a deep enough bench, not having enough people on the bus, mm -hmm. right? So you have a few people that decide that, you know, real estate's not for them, or maybe there's a better opportunity that fits their life better. Right. And they leave and you don't have anyone else coming in. Mm -hmm. And so now you hit massive pain where you're stepping up and jumping in at 11 PM mm -hmm. because you didn't have someone to step up behind them. I mean, you look at the Patriots and I mean, you look at Drew Brees and you look at Tom Brady and you look at the Packers and Brett Favre and Aaron Rodgers. Notice that they always have someone else to step in behind them that's learning from the legend mm -hmm. so that when the injury comes or the retirement comes, yeah. that someone's able to step up. Denver Broncos, they've had a running, they had a running back system forever. They would just plug and play a running back in there. And every year that, that, that running back would be at the top of the league for stats. Mm -hmm. And so I think about the same here, it's, life's gonna show up. Some people are gonna have challenges, some people are gonna get sick, some people are gonna have to take time off. We need to have people that are gonna step up and fill that role. I think it's irresponsible of us as leaders to allow our organization to get in a spot where, where really we are vulnerable to that. And, and that's where like, I started looking at, over the years I've really started to focus like, who am I at, what am I actually doing and who am I responsible for? And I know that every single person in my organization I'm responsible for their families as well. Like right. me as the me as the uh, the spokesperson for the brand, every action I take, every interview that I do, everything that I do, whatever I say and however I act could impact all of them. Right. And right. And that's and, and, yeah. and you can't take that lightly. Yeah. Right. And so that's a responsibility that that I have for all of them to do that. And so so being that I have that responsibility, if I'm not thinking the same way about the positions and the people in the organization. I'm really doing a disservice to everyone, right? right. If, if, my, if my main person or my main, my main leader in a department decides that, you know what, like I'm going to be a stay-at-home mom or I'm gonna be a stay-at-home dad or I'm looking for a new career or we're relocating somewhere else. Like I have a lot of families that are counting on that organization to run. Yep. I better have a plan to take someone off the bench and step up or get someone else that's on the bus to step up and fill that role. And by no means am I suggesting that people in my organization are interchangeable because they're not. At some level, you have to have someone that can step in and fill, and fill that role or that void right. um, at a moment's notice, right? Because I can tell you that nothing has ever went as planned in our organization, right? <laughs> like it, everyone gets ready for this perfect day where it's all gonna work out and like, oh, right. we're gonna move you over. It, it always comes when you're not expecting it mm -hmm. and it's a complete firestorm and, and you're moving like super quickly and you gotta move fast. And you don't always get it right either, right? I mean, there's been a lot of times where I've made a decision that wasn't the right one. Right. Now, I can tell you that there's, there's two sides to that. The downside is I made the wrong decision. The, the upside is I made a decision. There are a lot of people that get stuck in paralysis that don't even make a decision. Yep, what right? I call that is choice fatigue. Yeah, right, right. totally, totally. So, so, there's, so there's a couple of different ways to it. Um, another one that, that, we've, that we always uh, have had a challenge with is accountability. And so, you know, if you asked anyone in our organization or really most people in, the, in, in our world, they want to be held accountable, mm -hmm. right? They want to be held accountable. We haven't done a great job historically of holding our company accountable. Um, and so we're continuing to roll out different plans to get that accountability in place. But the way that we're rolling out accountability isn't about a leader barking down to the rest and saying, hey, do this, do that, do this. Yeah, you're being lazy, it's, you need to step it up, yeah. It's collectively the community together 
enforces the accountability, not the leader. Right. Right. So together we get better. We make commitments mm -hmm. and we do those things. And, and if you look at most problems in organizations, it's usually accountability. Right. It really is. It's usually like someone wasn't accountable to something. Someone didn't own something. Someone didn't step up and do it. Um, and for us, like, when I say accountability, like the number one thing in our organization for accountability is not probably what most think it is. It's not professional, it's personal. Because we need our people to be good human beings and to be rock solid personally. Mm -hmm. The professional side will work itself out. We've got that side figured out. Right. But I'm af what I'm after is I'm after like, how do we help people become the best human beings that they possibly can? Mm -hmm. Because if we have a world in Crystal Dell Real Estate of super positive leaders where we're investing in personal development for them, like the challenges they have with clients, the challenges they have with neighbors, the challenges they have with other agents, other brokers, other team leaders, those things go away when they're a leader, mm -hmm. right? I have challenges every single day, right? And it's the same thing with the people in our organization. We just continue to invest in them. There's no better ROI than investing in human beings. Right, right, especially yourself, right? Yep, because the better right. you become as a leader, 100%. you can, add, this is a trickle down effect. That's right. Right, it's a fountain of knowledge. You're yep. at the top and then the people beneath you and they, and then it just, it's a, what you're calling, if I could summarize what you kind of said is that the, the cure for lack of accountability is culture, a mm -hmm. positive culture. Mm -hmm. Because what you were saying is that the community around them is what makes a human being accountable, holds them accountable. It's not the person above them, their boss, that's yelling at them and saying like, step up to the They'll plate. They'll leave. They'll right. leave the organization. No one wants a dictator. Right, right. No one wants a dictator. It, it's it's collective. It's the peers. It's And it's not just like your peers saying like, hey, you need to step up. It's, it's the feeling of almost like if you would almost, not that I'm saying this word for word, but they would be embarrassed to not hit their metrics or not the do their best. They feel the pressure, right? right. Like that, it's like if you go, I mean, it's no different than, you know, if you're in a, a workout class at six days a week, right. if you don't show up, you're embarrassed when someone reaches out and go, hey, where were you? Yeah. Like you feel a pressure like, oh, I wasn't there. I didn't right. show up. Right. I didn't show up for my team. I didn't show up for the community. Right. And even when you do show up and let's say that you can't do that one push up, everybody's there cheering you on. 100%. Like you can do it, you know? And yeah. even if you, even when you're done, they'll say, hey, good effort. You know what I mean? And then you feel good. And then you want to do more the next time and the sure. next time and, and the next more. time. Yeah. And now all of a sudden your commitments are way higher, yeah. right? Like way higher reps. than you, yeah, you're doing more reps and you're putting higher numbers out there than you ever thought was possible because of the support system around you. Mm -hmm. And it's not just a pure motivational thing, it's also the ecosystem of learning from each other. Mm -hmm. Because you might have someone who is two years ahead, that doesn't sound like a lot, but two years is a lot, right? To the person who's on the bottom, right? So they're thinking, wow, this person's two years ahead of me. And then my dad, he grew up, he was a, the best salesman in Northwest Bank back before it was acquired by like Wells Fargo. And that's because he asked, he said, when he got started right out of college, he said, put me next to the best salesman in the company. So he shared, uh, he didn't share, he was right next, they had a little cubicle divider, and he would just, for the first couple days, he just didn't answer any calls, and he just listened. Yeah, smart. And listened to what he did. And then he mimicked the things he liked, and then he tweaked the things that he thought he could do better. And that was before like cross-selling was a really huge thing back, yeah. back in the day. So like, he started doing cross-selling to people, like he would open it up on their computers, this is when computers were just kind of like yeah. catching on, right? <laughs> He's old, right? AOL. And he was like, oh, I see you're in your account, you have X amount of dollars sitting there in just your savings. Like, would you think about an investment account or blah, blah, blah. And that's how he improved is the ecosystem that he, it wasn't the company that necessarily, so if you're listening to this and you feel like your company doesn't have that ecosystem, first of all, uh, maybe consider being an entrepreneur and build your own ecosystem, but do what Chris did, right? He was a part of a company for, he was part of two different companies before he ventured out and did his own thing. Build the ecosystem that you want with your own team, with the people around you, and then it's, it's, it's infectious, yeah, right? Yeah, for sure. It's, it's, like a, it's like a sickness, right? In a good sense that like everyone starts to get on fire. I'm sure that if we walked momentum. in here, exactly. momentum, right? Exactly. I mean, I mean, and you get momentum, the dopamine gets released and you're like, just like, and, and everyone, I mean, I know everyone watching, I mean, we all go through ups and downs in life, right? Yeah. When you're on that up, like, I mean, whatever you do, you're like crushing it. Like, yeah. you're like, and then when you go down, it's like, well, it's because you lost momentum, Yeah. right? And so you have momentum and you're just literally going. And when you have a community where it's all momentum, mm -hmm. like that ball gets rolling and it's hard to stop, mm -hmm. you know? And, and, and when someone gets down, someone reaches down and pulls them up. Right. So let's talk about, let's talk to the audience who, let's say they have a team of either they're a solopreneur or they've got a small team of five people or less. They don't have a deep bench. They don't have all the running backs that are ready, queued up to replace the people. You know, somebody gets sick, somebody gets a different job, somebody, uh, ABC, it doesn't matter, right? Yeah. How can they 
build that ecosystem and build that accountability um, uh, culture without having that deep bench? How do they get yeah. started? Yeah, great question. I, I think the number one thing that comes to mind right when you said that is cast a vision. Mm -hmm. You know, I think too often, uh, you know, and, and if we're talking to, uh, this is making the assumption that we're talking to the leader or the visionary or, right. you know, the, the, the person that is, is leading sort of the, the vision of the company. Mm -hmm. The challenge is, is we have, what we have going on in our head is a completely different vision than what we broadcast to our organization. Mm -hmm. uh, and I found that early on in my career and in, in, in growing our team is I had all these ideas, mm -hmm. but I never shared them. Mm -hmm. So there was confusion all over the place, right? So I'd go into a meeting and I'd get super frustrated because, so, yeah, 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 but I never told them. Yeah. <laughs> like I never told them. Don't you realize yeah, what we're trying yeah, to build here? Yeah, correct. Yeah. Yeah. So I never, you know, and so that's why like having some sort of framework that you're following, it can be super simple to all the way super complicated. I mean, it, you know, if you don't have a budget for it, you can do it yourself. There's lots of books out there, plenty of different frameworks you can follow right. on how to like really build a foundation and cast a vision for your organization. But I think that's the biggest one. Like if you don't tell people where they're going and, and where you're going as a group mm -hmm. and be fully transparent, right? And vulnerable at the same time. Mm -hmm. Like, hey, we're, we've got five people. We don't have the budget for more. I know that some of you are working harder more than, than I want you to be, right. but here's where we're going. We just need this to happen to get there. Yep. And you start casting that vision. Yep. I think it makes a massive difference because I can tell you right now, you know, I've had the opportunity to be in so many organizations and, and speak all over the country to, to entrepreneurs and business owners. The number one thing, people don't know where the leader's going yep. or there has been no communication. So trust breaks down. They don't trust where they're going. Yeah. Because they've got a chaotic visionary leader that's got everyone dizzy with whiplash mm -hmm. of like, let's do this, let's do this, let's do that, let's do this. Mm -hmm. And nothing's getting done and everyone's spinning in circles. Yep. And the challenge is, is no one's holding the visionary accountable mm -hmm. to like, hey, great idea, but let's figure out how to keep this in between the lines. Right. And, and I think those are the things that maybe you don't even have a blueprint that you're following today, but I think to solve for the future, you need it. Right. You need, because back to accountability, like I need to be held accountable. I can't just run around and go completely insane with crazy ideas and, yeah. you know, because what happens is, is you can tell people just like go white in the face and they're like, oh, where do we go? How do we start? What That's are we going to do? One, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So not only casting the vision of like the destination, but I think reeling it back to here's how we're going to get there. Yeah, totally. Right. Yeah. Because oh, we're going to be a billion dollar company. That's way too broad. How are we going to do that? Like we want to be the, the household name for real estate, right? Like we want to be the name. Okay, how are we going to do that? Yeah, and to your point, I think the other thing too is is often we set a vision or we set goals or metrics or you know, maybe it's timelines and they're not measurable. Yeah. Right? So mm -hmm. like so you mentioned like hey, we're going to be a household name. What does that mean? Yeah. Like how do we try how do we track do that? Track that? Yeah. Like when do we get there? When do we know we got there? When are you right? Cheating? Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. So so having something that obviously having something you can take action on. But you also have to be able to measure it is the other part of that. Yeah. And I think that's the part where a lot of people struggle mm -hmm. is they set these big lofty, like, here's my why, like my big thing I'm going to go tackle, right. right? And it's so overwhelming and unachievable that we never, ever reach it. Right. So we're really focused in our company on micro commitments. Like, what are we going to do today or in seven days? And we know that if we take that action every single day or every seven days, we know that the next week will be better because we took action. Now, if you, let's just say that you had someone said, hey, here's my 12 month goal. Mm -hmm. Well, natural human being, the natural instinct of human beings is we're gonna wait till the, I don't know, the 11th month, the 360th day, yeah. and we're gonna cram all this stuff in. 90% of that, yeah. Yeah, and we're gonna, we're gonna get close to our goal. Right. But what if you created an environment where you were under that pressure every single day through micro commitments? Yep. Like massive difference, right? Like mm -hmm. you'll have someone that, you know, maybe there's a contest going on that will play super hard for that one day and then the next week they'll do nothing. Well, then you go back and figure out like, why'd you play so hard that day? Because I knew that if I played hard in this game, I could be in the championship game tomorrow. But what if you were playing every single game knowing that you were gonna be in a championship? I mean, Reggie Miller years ago, what he scored, nine points in eight seconds? Like if you took the average of him scoring that many points the entire game, he would have had thousands of points. Right. Yet he knew that they were down, they were losing, and so like he had that commitment, right? Like he's like, here's what we got to do. We got to win this game. I'm going to win this game right now. Like, and that's the environment that we need to figure out how to put not only ourselves, but everyone in our organization in all the time. How do you create that pressure? I mean, 
the Patriots. Like, if there's not a declaration, like, at the beginning of the year that says, hey, we're going to go get the Lombardi Trophy, we're going to win the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. Like, if they're not going and shooting for something, they're never going to get there. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing there, right? I mean, it's the Twins have been playing great. I mean, the beginning of the year, they go, like, we're going to win the World Series. Like, yeah. that's what's going on, right? right? And so every single day, we're going to take steps. We're going to do meal planning. We're going to work out. We're going to play our game. You know, here's how many pitches, how many at-bats. I mean, there's all of these metrics along the way. Yet in business, so many people don't live by those same standards. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what is Chris Lindahl Real Estate's vision? And then how are you guys measuring your micro commitments? Yeah, so, so the micro commitments are specific to the people, Got not it. to the organization. Got it. Because every person has different micro commitments that collectively as a whole Depends lead on their role in the organization. 100%, right? right. You get to back how many phone calls, how many people did you meet, how many people did you network with, how many contracts 100%. did you get out? Right. So, so everyone in our organization sends an end of day report by video, sure. which probably makes a lot of people comfortable watching. Most people don't want to be on video. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why we do it, right? We want to help people grow. And so yeah, we know that like if they're on video and they're, and they're giving the end of day report, and it also gives us uh, a pulse for what's going on in the organization, right? So as we get our leaders that send us videos, like, okay, where are they stuck? How do we get them unstuck? How do we support them? Like, I think a lot of times we think that like end of day reports and in, in these reporting dashboards that we receive back are to hold people accountable. Why aren't you making enough calls? Why aren't you hitting your KPIs? Blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. For us, it's like, we want that information so that we can support them and help them get unstuck. Right. I think for others, it's like, how do we pound more down them? How do we force them to do more? Right. For us, like, we don't have a large vision anymore. Mm -hmm. Like, we know that if every single day we take care of our micro commitments, the rest will work itself out. Mm -hmm. Like, we go day by day by day. We don't have any lofty, like, hey, we're going to be in 27 cities or 1,000 cities. Or, you know, we're focused on, on Minnesota and Wisconsin. And, you know, maybe at some point we enter other bordering states, but probably unlikely. We've got a lot of work to, hear, to do here. We're still learning. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of market share. We've got a lot of people to help. You know, the, the real estate industry is changing. Uh, which creates a great growth opportunity for us. Uh, the traditional real estate agent of, you know, putting a sign in the yard, uh, doing an open house and put it in the MLS and putting a lockbox on the door right. um, for exorbitant amount of money is gone. Like there has to be some sort of technology and there, you know, and there has to be a marketing plan. Right. Really, there has right. to be some significant marketing plan. So what, what I know is going to happen because I'm watching it right now is a lot of the home buyers and home sellers that were loyal to a real estate agent are now deciding that, hey, this is the most significant investment in my life. I'm not gonna commit to the next door neighbor who's doing it part time or the person that I used to coach with or the aunt or the cousin or the uncle. Like, I'm gonna go with the best, the ones that I see marketing all over the place because I'm gonna get more money. Right. Like, and it's starting to, it's starting to transition from this very personal transaction mm -hmm. to more business. Because it, it has a tangible effect on their finances. It, For most people, like you said, it's the largest investment they'll make in their life, mm -hmm. which means when they sell and when they buy, those are the biggest moments as far as financial decision making goes. So they want somebody who is in a pro, right? So that way they make the right decision at the right time for the right cost. That's right. That's awesome. So, so where do you see those small mom and pop uh, agencies going in the next 10 years? Gone. Okay. Gone, yeah. The, the, the small mom and pop bro brokers will be gone. I think there, there might be a couple exceptions to that. I think maybe some of the rural areas, mm -hmm. right, where there's not as much of a technology focus. Right. But it, it, this has become, this is going to become who can market the best. Mm -hmm. And the small mom and pops just can't afford to market. Sure. You know, marketing is super expensive. And quite honestly, the clients deserve the marketing. Right. I mean, they really do. I mean, the right. days of like, like I had mentioned earlier, of just throwing it out there and the letting up. the MLS hopefully bring another agent to bring a buyer right. are over. Like people are busy, they're distracted, mm -hmm. uh, social media, smartphones, all of these other things. Like we have to go out and reach people mm -hmm. to bring them in. Mm -hmm. The days of like sitting back and just waiting, people won't show up. Right. So that, this is a great pivot point to talk about marketing because yeah. you think that marketing is the main gasoline on the fire that is changing the real estate industry. How are you marketing and why are you the best at it? Well, I don't know that I'm the best. I, I, I'm, uh, I'm definitely learning. Um, I think I, in real estate. Yeah. The best. Yeah. So what I'm doing now is I'm just trying to f figure out where the consumer's at. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and one thing that, that I've learned about marketing is it's about being omnipresent. Right. So it's, you've got, you've got to have this like takeover effect. Like right. this entity or person is everywhere. 
that is exactly what you have to get after because if you're not, if you're not making an impression and, and people don't have an opinion of you, whether it's positive, negative, or neutral, LPR is good. then they're not noticing it. Right. Then they're not noticing it, you know? And so for us, it's like, okay, you're driving home, you see us, you're driving to work, you hear us, you go on social media, you see us, you see the video, you go on LinkedIn, you go on Facebook, you go on Twitter, you go on Instagram, you go on all this, you see our properties, you see this different stuff. All of these things are happening at all times so that you can't get away from us. Mm -hmm. No matter, in, in some of them, no matter what you do, like there's not an unsubscribe button to the highway. Right. Or, or like, right. or like there's certain things like to the radio, like, right. you know, if that's your favorite station or genre that you love, like. You're gonna listen to it. You are, whether, you know, and, and some people I know don't love what we do, but I can tell you what, what, here's what most, I don't think have a good grasp of when it comes to marketing, specifically to real estate is people will say, oh, we're so tired of hearing and seeing Chris. Like, we, I would never use you as a real estate agent because of that. Right. There's a certain amount of the population that make that statement. Mm -hmm. What they don't realize is, would they rather use a real estate agent that does no advertising and no market at all? Because that's what they're suggesting. Like, I would never use you because you market. I'd rather use someone that, that no one knows who they are, right. that no one can see. I don't want to get my whole home sold faster. And for more money, right? And so this is what, and it, and it happens. And make, people make these comments like, that marketing is all over the place, I would never use that. And so, but really what happens, I think people think we're always self-promoting, but in reality what's happening is, we're using all of these mediums to drive traffic to our website, which in return, more people sign up, we have more eyeballs on our clients' listings, yep. which create more buying opportunities, which create more multiple offers. Right. All of that awareness leads back to our site where our clients and sellers that we work with, get the, their houses get to be displayed first. Right. So the way I think that a lot of my audience members would understand is that you're building a marketing funnel and you and your brand and your advertising is merely the top of the funnel. People right. see you, hear you, um, drive by you, watching this show, they're gonna, that's the top of the funnel. Then they click the link in the show notes to your website, right? That's the second level in the funnel. Then they click a listing, then guess what? They book an appointment and they buy a house, that's right. right? So at the bottom of the funnel yeah. is your customers, your clients, the people who are selling and buying homes. You're merely the top of the funnel that's funneling in yeah. because that's the, that has to cast the widest net that's right. to get the most people through the bottom. Yeah. And the top of the funnel it, it, for us is the easy part now. When I first started marketing it really at the mass level, you know, we would add a medium and it might take 18 months to even break even, mm -hmm. right? We would lose money for a significant amount of time. Right. Now we don't have that same problem because we can invest in something else and we already have the brand equity right. and the awareness where when we were first starting, we were proving ourselves, no one knew who we were. Right. And so that's a significant difference. Yeah. It's a significant difference on the way that things are done mm -hmm. where the challenges are, are in the bottom of the funnel. Mm -hmm. How do you get a hold of someone? Right. right, they fill out the form and they say, "Hey, I want to be emailed only," and you send them an email and they never reply. Right, or never right, it, open. or never open it, or maybe it hits the spam box. Right. right, I mean, there's all these other things of like, how do you actually get to them? And then you know, now there's artificial intelligence. So it's like, okay, if they take this intent, we're going to send them this, or we're going to do this. Well, what if that's not perfect and it has one thing that's not quite right, and they respond back and go, "Hey, take me off your list. I asked for this and you sent me that." Right. right. So the bottom of the funnel is where the challenges are because we're still a little early with a lot of the artificial intelligence, machine learning, all the things that are happening, we're still a little bit early. And mm -hmm. I think what happens is people get afraid of, of technology like, hey, it's going to replace human beings. Right. Like in the right scenario, it's going to enhance human beings. Mm -hmm. So we're still learning some of that stuff. Like the top of the funnel isn't the problem. We're bringing the traffic in, we're getting attention. I know that because I watch my Twitter notifications. <laughs> like, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> that's how I judge a, a marketing campaign. Like I can tell from the positive and negative feedback on Twitter. Right, right. How many people are tagging you, <laughs> right, mentioning yeah. you, yeah. Right. you search your hashtag, you're yeah. like, oh, all right. Yeah, we have a team that monitors that, but yeah. Awesome, okay. How, okay, when it comes to mediums, when it comes to platforms, everybody is all in on social right now. They say digital is the way. You're breaking apart from that. You're yeah. doing billboards, you're doing radio, right? You're doing speaking engagements. Mm -hmm. Why the separation? Well, for one, everyone has a different audience, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, in real estate, you may be after homeowners, you may be after home buyers, you may be after renters. Like that platform is gonna change where right. you're gonna target, right? Like if, if you're targeting renters, maybe you go social, maybe you go younger. Mm -hmm. If you're targeting older, maybe you go a different medium. And so mm -hmm. for me, 
it's, I don't look at it as being one or the other, and I don't look at it as being one and not the other. Right. I look at it as being all of them. Yep. Right. And know that like, and it's a totally omni channel, you know, when I look at it, I go, okay, we need to be in every single area. And then what we start to do is we really start to focus on where we know we have presence and where we don't. And that's why, you know, with the I mean, full disclosure on, you know, like you had mentioned where, you know, 500 buses and trains and, and we'll have planes flying and everything else. Mm -hmm. The reason why we're doing all of that is because we're focused on the areas where we know we don't have as much marketing. Right, we have a couple pockets left where, you know, downtown Minneapolis, you have commuters. You have all of these people that are coming to town. Like if you could concentrate a marketing strategy that got attention in an area where there are a lot of commuters, uh, a lot of people that are, you know, employed with really good jobs, um, that would get a lot of attention, right? And so that's why we're focused on those areas. And we just have, I feel like we're just missing a couple pieces um, before we completely take over the entire uh, Minnesota and Wisconsin market mm -hmm. from a marketing standpoint where literally everyone's gonna know who we are. So you're thinking about it from like a demographic standpoint. You're looking at, okay, these people in this suburb definitely know who we are because we're advertising them on five different platforms That's and right. mediums. But the people in downtown, they have a lack of awareness or we need to, or maybe no awareness at all. So here's our solution is we need to yeah. find a marketing campaign that will specifically target those people. If they commute to downtown, then Twitter isn't something that we can necessarily target them with. Of course, yeah. How can we target commuters? Commuters, well, how do they commute? Buses and trains. Yeah. Great. We'll slap our, our logo and you know the arm stretch, and then that's going to exploit. That's going to get our awareness increased in that demographic. That's right. So and then also and then also there's sports too, right? Mm -hmm. So Twins were playing well. Like a lot of people are going to commute in to watch the game. Yeah. Um, and then you know I mean when you look at Condos, like condos are a different way. You, you've got to market to condos differently than you would single family homes. Right. Because a lot of people on condos might not have a car. They might not be on the highway. Right. Like there really aren't many billboards in downtown Minneapolis, right? So we have to look at different strategies and we do things that are so large that no one can compete against us mm -hmm. because it's so expensive that no one else can afford to do it, mm -hmm. which creates even more of a significant advantage for us mm -hmm. because then all of our clients get the benefit of all of that initial traffic that we're driving to our platforms. Right, right. So how, do you, how does the average, let's say that there's a real estate uh, agent who's hoping to build a brand like you yeah. someday, how do they get from where they are now to the point where they can plaster their name and their brand yeah. on all the all the right. trains and buses. So I think number one is they have to identify if they have the risk tolerance. Mm -hmm. I think that's the number one. And and listen, there will be a lot of real estate agents that are going to watch this that might not have the appetite for what we're doing. Right. And that's the beautiful thing about business is it yeah. doesn't. Not my way is not the right way, and what we do isn't for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, but risk tolerance is a big one. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, for for years we weren't profitable, right? I mean, so as we built out the infrastructure. And I, I think a lot of entrepreneurs and businesses talk about like that in-between stage, mm -hmm. right? Where you went from small, where you're profitable, like where you were doing the sales, so you didn't have to pay another sales rep. Right. Now you hired one and you have an overhead there. And like you have this in-between where things are rocky and it's tough. And like, and, and you know, and then you break through that and then it starts to get really good. And so we're right. way past that now, mm -hmm. but we had years where we were investing for the future. Mm -hmm. Most people aren't willing to continue to invest that way. Right. Um, and I was for, very fortunate and I would suggest anyone that's looking to build any sort of business like comparable to what we did, don't do it until you have a personal brand that can support it. Yep. Right. I think that's the biggest mistake. Like you'll get someone that's six months, 12 months into real estate and they're like, I want to start a team. I'm going to go buy marketing and leads, mm -hmm. but no one knows who they are. Right. Right. So they buy leads until the leads get too expensive or until they find out their agents aren't converting the opportunities and it's too expensive for them to do. Right. Those are the things that I see most people make mistakes on and and for us like when i look at our organization i look at where it is today my for me like when i take risk on something like i now know what's going to happen mm -hmm. right early on i didn't and so i know i can i can sympathize for a lot of people that are watching like wow like what if i throw this out there what's going to happen yeah i didn't know nobody calls right correct and that's and that's the scary thing about branding mm -hmm. Right, you're just throwing branding out there. No, maybe no one does call. Right. In a lot of cases, they don't. And I think the biggest mistake that people make with that is they throw it out there and they quit too soon. Because mm -hmm. most people don't have the risk tolerance, right? So, 12 months after you you launch it, and you're like, ooh, I don't know if I can afford this any longer. Mm -hmm. And you know, you quit, and maybe come to find out the person that stuck with it 24 months made it. 
Right. Right. And I think people give up too early. Mm-hmm. And so that's, that's one area where, where I, I think that a lot of people need to sit down and look in the mirror and go, do I really have the risk tolerance to, to break even at best for multiple years? And the patience to yeah. wait for it. Right. Mm-hmm. And look for clues along the way. Like at Crystal Dell Real Estate, we're, we're students first. Like we're always looking for, you know, like what did we learn from this? Like what didn't work? We fail all the time. Like what information can we get from what we just failed on? Whether that's marketing or whether that's something else mm-hmm. and take that and learn how to apply that into something else. Because growth is like, a lot of times growth looks oddly familiar, right? right? Like, I mean, it's, a lot of stuff doesn't change. Like, hey, I've kind of been here before. Like, yeah. this looks similar to what Pretty happened shabby. here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and, and so all of those things that I learned. So when I look at, you know, the mistakes that we've made along the way, they were never really mistakes because I learned from them. Mm-hmm. You know, and I learned so much that I don't know that our brand would be where they were today. Had you not made those mistakes. No, no, totally. Right. Because it equips you to make better decisions down the road, more strategic decisions. Let's say a billboard campaign crashed and you thought, okay, let's analyze why it crashed. Oh, it's because we targeted this neighborhood, which is not our target customers. Yep. But everybody loved it. We had tons of tweets. We had tons of uh, people talking about it, but no conversions. Great. We know that was a great campaign. So let's, re- let's use that messaging that we learned was well but let's change the demographic. Let's go into this particular neighborhood, right? Yeah, it's totally. getting better. It's iterating, right? Improving your process. 100%. Yeah, and that's, um, you know, that's what we've learned over time is, is everything that we learn. Yeah. I mean, everything that we, like, as we, like, analyze, like, the information that we take from things that didn't work is the best intel we have. Yeah. Right? Because most people aren't willing to take the risk on something. That, that, if something starts to fail, they stop. Yeah. We keep going. We keep going because we're learning. Like, why isn't this working? Is it, to your point, like, is it the neighborhood? Mm-hmm. Is it the creative? Right. Is it the way it's displayed? Is it behind trees? Yeah. Is it on the wrong station? Right. Like, is it on the wrong social platform? Like, mm-hmm. all of this information and like, the time of day, like, why is that one running here? Or why did that show up here? And then adjust, yeah. right? For sure, pivot. Yep. Always, never comfortable. Like, always learning, like, we never sit still. Mm-hmm. And I could tell you that any real estate brokerage team or agent that sees our brand right now, could literally go and look and copy anything that we're doing right now and it would not be effective because they don't know why we're doing it. Right. Right. They don't have sort of the algorithm behind the curtain of why things are going where in the, in the critical decisions we're making on why we're putting things. They just see the front end. Right. And I think too often as business owners, that's what we see of people like, right. oh, I'm going to go do that because it was successful for them. Mm-hmm. But what we don't realize is they did 14 other things before they did that. Yep. Right. And a lot of people, you know, it was the same thing with billboards. We had so many people that when we launched the massive billboard campaign, we had agents that put like two or three of them up here, there. Well, they didn't spend seven years doing all of the other things like the direct mail, the videos, the social media, all of these other things that led to brand awareness Mm -hmm. before the billboards were the last thing we did. Yep. And so a lot of people start with that. Mm -hmm. They're like, oh, no one pulled over on the side of the road and called me. (laughs) Well, no one is going to. Like billboards don't generate calls. It's a total branding effort. That's it. And I think just watching people do that, you know, is exactly why people are totally comparing that, that front end, like that, like I said earlier, like the social media, the appearance, right? right? What that aesthetically that looks like it works, but they really don't know why. Yep. They don't know that they don't know your funnel, right? Yep. And the funnel might be that billboards is halfway through. You've already hit them up with a direct mail, a postcard, right? And you've already tweeted them and you've already, maybe you've done a phone cold call, right? And then by the time they see the billboard, and let's face it, how often does somebody buy and sell a house? A couple times in their life, right? Yeah, that's right. So not everybody that you sees that billboard is a potential customer no, at that most time. Most are not. Right? But they see that, and two years later, they're thinking, I got to sell my house. And they think of you because you've already hit them up a dozen times in their life. They just weren't in a position where they could have done business with you. Maybe they didn't have the capital to buy their first home yet. Yeah. We're making a lot of traction as referrals. Mm-hmm. It, to your point is someone saw our marketing here, it came in contact with it several times, yeah. and they've got a daughter or a son, a niece, a nephew, a sister, a brother, yeah. a friend, a coworker, mm-hmm. right? Brother, sister, whatever it may be. And they're like, oh, you should try Chris and his team. Right. Like, I, like I just, they just sold four in my neighborhood. Yeah. And I hear them, see them, like they're right. literally everywhere. I'm not selling, right. but I know you are. And I know so what happens is, is, is when you create a brand, now you have all these loyal advocates, right? Yeah. Where, and, and, we, and we don't take that for granted. We do contests and giveaways and things back 
to our supporters all the time mm -hmm. because we're so grateful of all of our supporters. I mean, you know, when you post this video, we're gonna have people that have followed me, friends of mine, friends of the company that are gonna comment on social media, on LinkedIn and Facebook and Twitter and say, you know, I love everything they're doing. I mean, we're gonna have all those kind of comments. And right. so, and that, and, and I don't take that for granted because I know there are a lot of people that don't get any of that recognition. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm just grateful that we're in this position. That's awesome. Let's talk about how you, how somebody who's listening can build a system of their own. Because what you told me before we started recording was that, let's just explain what you do so that way they understand it and then we can talk about how they can apply it. How is it that a real estate uh, agent uh, considers joining your team and why it's beneficial for them to work with you versus doing something else? Yeah, so risk is a big part of it, right? So a real estate agent that would join our organization has zero risk. Right, so at the end of the day, they know exactly what's gonna happen. Mm -hmm. They know that they're gonna have unlimited opportunities and they're, we're gonna have a system that's going to take away all of their weaknesses so they can focus on what they love. In most cases, if you're a real estate agent, you love talking to people, you love meeting people, yeah. you love being in the community. You're very extroverted. Yep, right? yep, you, you don't love the paperwork, you don't mm -hmm. love the follow-up. Yep. You know, those are all the things we take care of for you and so. Why, I, how, how do you take care of it? Yeah, so we have, we have different systems in place, right? So. So we have listing coordinators and transaction coordinators and we have marketing coordinators and all of these people, you know, it's like you get a new listing. If you're an agent, you get a new seller that's ready to go on the market. We handle the open house scheduling. We handle the flyers. We handle the social media marketing. We handle everything that, or the sign, ordering the sign, ordering the lockbox. Right. Everything that we, we take care of all of that for them. And then they get to do what they love. That's talk right. to people, that's close right. deals. I think of like, so in our organization, like, what I was after, and because this is, and I'm not saying this is the only way, mm -hmm. I didn't like cold calling. Mm -hmm. I didn't like cold calling. I didn't like prospecting. I didn't like calling friends and family going, right. hey, do you know anyone looking to buy or sell a house? Yeah. And, Can you refer me to five people, yeah, you and, know? And, yeah. and most brokers train that way, right? Right. So they train everyone that way, and it's a burnout job. Six months in, you're like, I hate real estate. I don't want anything to do with it. Yep. I wanted to create an environment where everything was inbound. Right, where it's like, hey, we want to work, we see you, we hear you, like we want to be a part of that. We know that you're on the cutting edge of what's going on and we want to be a part of that because this is our biggest investment. Right. So when I look at our organization now, I think of it a lot like traveling. Mm -hmm. Like when you go travel at another brokerage, like you're going to go book your airfare, book your hotel. And in our organization, it's like all inclusive. Everything is handled for you. Mm -hmm. Like in what leads to more opportunities, a healthier bottom line, a lot of real estate agents think with a scarcity mindset. You know, let me show you how. Most real estate agents go to the broker that offers the best commission split. They, the average real estate agent, depending on the report, approximately sells seven homes a year. Mm -hmm. Like that's the average. So I know the average. Yep. And most real estate agents, you know, let's just say that they sell seven homes in a year, 10 homes in a year, go, no, I'm at this broker because the split's good. Mm -hmm. Well, they don't do any business. Right. So, so getting 100% of seven opportunities is, is significantly lower than let's say getting 70% of a hundred. Right. Right. But, right. but too often we have this scarcity mindset and I've had it too myself where we're so focused on, you know, like, Oh, we can't go there because we got to pay for this or pay for that. Right. We're going to where this, where the splits are. But like, yeah, but you have no opportunity and no business. Yep. No one knows your broker name. Yep. That's the other one too. Like in a lot of brokers, the brokers are doing no marketing and no advertising. The only way they're building their brand, is by hiring real estate agents or giving them high splits and hoping the real estate agents sell friends and family homes and they put their broker sign in the yard and they have all these mini billboards all over the place. Yep. So there's no opportunities for the agent to grow. The agent, it's actually inverted. It's the on agents, their back to get the inbound. They're like, hey, right. we're gonna exploit your network. We're that's not right. gonna use our funnel to feed you leads. We're hoping that you use your community, your network to get us leads, right? That's right. But that's why they do the commission structure that way. There's a lot of companies like that. Like the mutual fund store was just acquired a couple of years, two years ago or something like that. My uncle was a broker there mm -hmm. for uh, investment. And he said that was a similar model there is like their national marketing, they had a huge radio show, was so massive that they had a smaller commission split but they never needed leads and they never did needed marketing. So he never had those two costs associated yeah. because at any time he could log in and just start and this is, by the time it got to him, it was like their third touch point. And they were like, okay, yeah, I'm ready. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? And he's so, like, I would, so it's the classic analogy of, I'd rather have a slice of a watermelon than 100% of a grape. That's right, 100%. Right. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. And, yeah. and 
you know, and, and, and I think what people are starting to find out in the real estate industry is how expensive it's becoming to market, mm -hmm. to really create that team environment because every client deserves the experience that Crystal Nell Real Estate gives, yep. whether they're with us or not. Mm -hmm. Like the, what we've built is what everyone should experience. Mm -hmm. Whereas if it's an individual real estate agent alone, the client's not gonna get that experience, right? It's one person. If they're in another showing and they have your house listed and a, sell, a buyer, a potential buyer calls on your listing mm -hmm. and they're showing a home, guess what? That call gets missed. And you what we know about, and, and we know about stats of getting someone back on the phone, yep. slim to none that they ever get a hold of that buyer again. Right. Any, you know, vacation. I mean, I lived it. Like you go on vacation and you're out trying to enjoy family time. Yep. Like business stops. Yep. Because you're, you're the bottleneck in your business. You're the bottleneck in the, the transaction versus if it funnels through something like you, yep. they could be at the beach with their family on a Saturday. Maybe it's their first Saturday off in months and they just want to enjoy that day and they don't have to worry about losing out on potential no. deals. Because we've got the support system in place for them, right? right. So that's why we have that all-inclusive resort right. where things don't get dropped or missed. And I, and I lived it, you know, and uh, you know, I can tell you that it, it's changing and the consumer deserves better. You know, the fact that an individual real estate agent has been able to market themselves as a rock star in different neighborhoods, because that's traditionally how real estate agents, hey, I'm an expert in XYZ city, yeah. has been able to market and advertise their business in a way where they're one person and they're doing everything is fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. No business operates uh, at, at, at max efficiency right. with one person. No. I mean, a lot of people watching here, I mean, how many of them are running the whole thing themselves? Yeah, probably most of them. Most right. small businesses, statistically, isn't it like 50% of small businesses are solopreneurs or like a small mom and pop shop? Correct. And so when you think about solopreneurs yeah. and you call a real estate agent a solopreneur if they're alone, sure. they're handling the most significant investment in someone's life yeah. alone. They need to be the social media expert, the photographer, the stager. They got to answer the buyer calls, the seller calls. Mm -hmm. They got to handle the marketing flyers. Mm -hmm. They got to understand the Adobe to, to yep. create the marketing flyers. Yeah. They've got to promote it in involved. magazines, yeah. postcards, radio, TV, social media. Mm -hmm. They need to understand websites. They need to do you know, mm -hmm. retargeting and all of these different, all of this stuff yep. where it's impossible. Yeah, it's the classic, uh, the man who chases two rabbits catches none, That's right? right? So what you guys are doing is you are figuring out what, what real estate agents' strengths are and completely shining a spotlight on it and say, this is the one thing that you're gonna focus on is the thing that you're really good at. And where you're lacking in strength, we're gonna bring other people in to fill those gaps. And as a result, you're gonna get more results faster for a longer period of time. Yeah, you're, you're, more successful. you're right, you're absolutely correct. And, and you know the reason why our organization works the way it is is because I ran a successful team, right? So mm -hmm. our brokerage runs as a team, yeah. whereas most brokers have never run a team, yep. right? So, so the, the, the traditional brokerage, they offer a place for a real estate agent to hang their license. There's no leads, no opportunities, no technology, no, no, no support, support, nothing, right? There, 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 nothing exists mm -hmm. because that's the model they're in. And I'm not saying it doesn't work. Yeah. I just believe that that's transitioning out. Mm -hmm. And like having a full-blown team of support people where you can go home at night and spend time with your family and friends and kids and not take to take the calls because we've got someone that can take them for you. Yeah. And, and you don't have to feel overwhelmed and stressed all the time. Mm -hmm. Like that's interesting to me. I want people to have a good quality of life. This isn't about someone just being super successful at work and having a miserable personal life. Mm -hmm. Like we actually want their personal life to be the absolute best. Flourish. Yeah. Yep. And part of that is by having a great professional life. I always, people always say, oh, work-life balance, you know what I mean? As long as you have a good personal life, you're good. And I, I argue the opposite that like you work, f most people work 40 hours, right? Guys like you and I probably even work triple that, right? Stop. Yeah, yeah. Right. But when you take into account how many hours you're sleeping and how many hours you're working, you're working more, you work, I think it's like one third of your life. You sleep for a third, you work for a third, and then the other third is like personal shit from like yeah. childhood and then weekends and evenings with your adult life, right? Yeah, what's interesting about work-life balance is I really don't think it even exists, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, just to your point, like how, you know, we might work differently than how, you know, someone else might work 40 or 50 hours a week and we might work more or less than that. Right. Um, and to me, it's more about rhythm, mm -hmm. right? Because you and I might have a different rhythm, or we might have different rhythms, you don't, you right. know what I mean, right? Yeah. And, and what 
our rhythm is might be different than someone else's, but suggesting like work-life balance when you, when I hear that, it makes it sound like everything's e like, we're like, Hey, like we're supposed to be it's like 50, 50. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas like some people are like, you know what? I start working at 10 PM. That's just when I prefer to work and I work 10 PM to two in the morning or yep. it's 6 AM or 5 AM. I get in, everyone's got a different rhythm. And so for me, I, we always talk about our organization. I would say like, find the rhythm that works for you. Mm -hmm. Don't, don't draw this line in the sand that like you gotta, Hey, it's five o'clock. If someone calls me at 5.15 and wants to see a house, I got to tell them no, because now I'm at, my, I'm at my life balance. I'm on my personal side. Right. I can't cross the boundary. Yep. Yep. You have if to I figure out. to rejuvenate. You know, yeah. I, mean, so I can't pick up the phone. Yeah. No, it's, yeah, that's where we're really focused on rhythm. Sure. Uh, I think it makes us, you know, because everyone's got a different rhythm. Sure. So speaking of your rhythm, how do you um, spend your quality time, your, your personal time, what I would say? Yeah. How do you rejuvenate? How do you yeah. re-energize? Yeah. So. So for me, you know, I, I, have a, uh, I have two college degrees from Man, uh, Minnesota State University of Mankato in teaching. And so giving back and making a difference was always mm -hmm. a super big focal point for me. Um, so, uh, you know, our, our Be Generous campaign, uh, which is our number one core value mm -hmm. of giving back our time, treasures, and talents is super important to me. Sure. Uh, it energizes me. And really leveraging the platform that our organization together has built mm -hmm. and, and using that for greater good to give back and make a difference uh, and it's why I'm at this podcast right now, right? Is to right. give back what I've learned uh, to help maybe others not make the same mistakes. Right. And so those things completely energize me. Uh, and then spending time with my daughter, uh, Victoria, who's nine, um, who is, it's amazing how like, as she's like now growing into having her own like personality and like, yeah. uh, we're just getting so much closer as she gets older. And, and um, so those are, those are things, you know, I, I love to fish and, and, and golf and, and do those things, but Honestly, giving back and making a difference is what drives me, you know, and I think there's a lot of confusion when people hear giving back, they think write a check, right. you know, that's the easy thing to do, right? right? Writing a check, you know, and I'm not suggesting that it's easy to write a check for a lo large amount of money, but mm -hmm. any amount of money to write a check is easy, Yeah. right? So whatever that number is for you, whether it's $5 or $10 or $20, what's hard is time. Yep. yep. It's hard, right? I mean, that's super, super hard. Mm -hmm. And then the other one that most aren't willing to do because they're afraid someone's going to steal their magical ideas, it gives back their talent. Yep. Time right? Like, talent. yeah. So give back their talent. Like, what have I learned in real estate that could be applied to your audience of right. entrepreneurs, solopreneurs, right C-level? Okay. Same thing. Like, what could I give back? Like, even if it's just one thing, you know, I, I think like the, the, those tiny hinges swing big doors. Like, that one little thing, my, I hope, changes one person's life that's listening. Mm -hmm. And... The thing that's so crazy about life is most won't listen. Right. Most won't listen. Most aren't willing to get educated to grow their brain and figure out how do I get better at what I do? How do I master my craft? Right. Most aren't willing to do it. And the, but the one percent who do watch it, right? We're, how long have we been recording? Like forty-five minutes or something like I that. Don't know. Like for the one percent of the audience that has watched it this far, those are the people that are going to be using what you're saying Correct. the most. And those are the people who, you're talking about impact, be generous. Yep. You're being generous to those people. And like you said before with your team, you could be so excited for an individual to kick ass and take names, but they have to be willing to like receive that generosity and then use it, right? So that one person who's still watching, they're gonna take the knowledge that you're talking about right now and they're gonna be like, fucking A, I'm gonna do it. Yep. You know what I mean? Yeah, and those are the, those are the go-getters, right? I mean, yep. those are the, you know, there, there aren't as many of those. Um, but you know, I, I think too often we always we always get scared that someone's going to steal our magical idea, you know. Right. Um, and I've realized that most won't do it, mm -hmm. and the ones that will don't have your recipe, so it doesn't really matter if you share, anyways. Mm -hmm. I think I just tweeted yesterday. It was uh, the greatest uh, out of all your investments. The one that is your own business has something that's different than all others, and that's you. You are yeah. your best investment because whether it's stock or whether it's something else, you can use your knowledge to make something better. You're the one who's the hustler. You're the one with the vision, right? You're the one who can take what you've learned and take it to the next level, which is what it sounded like you're doing in the real yeah, estate. For sure. And, and I think as you grow the organization, you know, then you have others that grow up, right? And, yeah. the, and, and, and then they become the ones to take it to the next level, awesome. you know? And so you get the ball rolling and you get it started because you didn't probably have the budget or the, the, the knowledge to even know who to bring on. Sure. But as you grow, now you watch others bring their, I mean, there's some things happening in our organization right now where I'm looking at some of the things that are happening. I'm like, 
that is one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. Like I had no idea that anyone was even working on that. Right. And those are just the things that happen as you start to grow the organization. Yeah. And that's where like when you start to build a powerful brand, like you start to attract a different level of talent, right? Mm -hmm. The people that come into your organization that are interested are super talented. Like they want to, they, they realize like, listen, this brand is doing something different. Like yeah. I want to be a part of that. I want to be on the family. cutting edge. Like get, let me in that team, right? It's like right. no different than you look at the, you know, when you're, when you're young, like you've got the all-star basketball, football, golf team, whatever it may be. You're like, how do I get on that team? I want to win. Right. Yeah. I want to be on the A team, yeah. man. B team sucks. You know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah totally. So, so we can wrap up. Well, let's do a rapid fire question. Uh, first question is what's the best book that you've read that you think our audience should read? You know, I really like, uh, boy, that's a, that's a tough, tough question. Um, I have to say the one right now would probably be Amazon way when Amazon talks about like their the way that they were built and the, the convenience yeah. factor of the entire thing mm -hmm. um, is super interesting uh, yeah and Nordstrom experience all those are in you know, the Nordstrom book the Amazon book um, there's tons of leadership books uh, a friend of mine Tom Gartland has a book called lead with heart like on how to connect you know more emotionally mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I mean, I, it changes all the time, right? I mean, right. that's the thing I love about reading is that like you read a book and you can go back and read another one. Now there are tons of classics like mm -hmm. that I could name forever and ever and ever that I've sure. read that obviously played a, a significant part. But I can tell you that like the ones about taking care of the customer and creating convenience. I mean, mm -hmm. like earlier, right before we, we started, we talked about our guaranteed offer program. Right. Like that's a totally convenience based thing like Uber, like trading in a car, like all of the things that are happening today are exactly what led me to create guaranteed offer. Right. You push a button and you can sell your house. Yep. Like that is like Uber, that is like Amazon, it's the future. Right. I'm not saying it's for everyone. Right. Like you right? I mean, there's, you know, there's a you you give up a little bit of, you know, you you pay a little bit of a fee for for us to take the risk to to take that property on. Mm -hmm. But you have all the convenience in the world. It's exactly like if you go and trade in your car, you know that if you went and sold it private sale, you could get a little bit more money, but then you've got the headaches. You're going to post it on Craigslist. Right. Are you going to meet people? Right. Like all this. Or are you going to trade it in? Right. And, and it's it. the same thing with the house. Like you could go the traditional route, but then you've got to have showings. You've got to have people in your house. Mm -hmm. Do you want strangers in your house? Do you want the neighbors? Or would you rather go the other way where you can push a button and know the headaches are over? And by the way, you can go buy another house and you, you don't have to be contingent because you already have a cash accepted offer on yours. Right. And so those types of books that I read about like what's best for the consumer, what's the direction that our world is going. Sure. That's why I love books like the Nordstrom and, 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 um, and Amazon to really see what they're doing and how they're growing it because mm -hmm. uh, we can learn so much from it. So a lot of people follow you on social media. Who is someone that you follow on social media that you recommend others should follow? Brendan Bouchard is good. Yeah, like I love Brendan Bouchard. So I'm a certified high performance coach with Brendan's organization. Sure. Um, I did it just for personal development uh, and really leading and helping our organization. So I went and got um, certified to be a high performance coach with Brendan. He's got great content that he puts out there and, and uh, he's, a, he's a great human being. That's awesome. Okay, so you watch a lot of sports, right? Yeah. Who's your favorite sports team? Uh, ooh. I, I think I have to say the Wild. I mean, we're the official real estate company of the Minnesota Wild. That's too. Yeah, that's true. You're a little biased, right? Yeah. I actually love it, you know. And uh, you know, Matt Maka, uh, the president of the Wild, was just on my podcast, and uh, he's just a neat human being. And so I've really grown uh, great relationships within the Minnesota Wild organization. And so, sure. um, you know, it's just it's fun to see the behind the scenes yeah. of how they run the organization. Everyone always sees the finished product that they put on the ice, but you know, there's all the behind the scenes stuff, just like which is 100. percent right? Yeah. Awesome. What is one call to action that you want from the audience? What is one call to action I want from the audience? I want people to take action. Sure. <laughs> I mean, that's the call to action I want. I want people to, to literally take action. Um, you know, and I'm willing to do whatever I can to support anyone that has questions for me. Um, you know, I monitor all of my social media. If you send me a message or, um, you know, or, or, or post something in the comment section. And, sure. What's you know, the best platform for them to get a hold of you on? Uh, probably Facebook. Okay. Probably Facebook Messenger. Um, you know, my, my behind the billboard Facebook page that I have my podcast on. Um, yeah. I've had a lot of really good guests on the behind the billboard podcast. And so mm -hmm. 
I've, I've learned a ton from the guests and I'm not saying it's about me because I was just a small part of the, of the shows, but I, I, I learned a ton on the Behind the Billboard podcast. So that might be an area right. where people to get more information on things that we've done. Awesome. LinkedIn, LinkedIn uh, messaging is a, another area to add me on LinkedIn and send me a message when you send me a friend request on that you heard me on the show and then we'll accept you and, and I can connect with you there as well. Awesome. Chris, thanks yeah. a lot for being on the yeah, show. Yeah, no, I appreciate it, man. Thank you so fun. much. Yeah. See you guys. I, I come from a town where most of the people are so close minded. They go into school and they work in a job, but they don't even like it. I won't be put in a box. Nobody telling me what I should rock. Nobody telling me what I should drop. Cause I do what I want and just know I don't stop. Recording till four in the morning, they snoring. I'm pouring my soul into every story. I'm writing, producing, I mix it, I master, I'm building my craft and I'm not looking back. I've been going doing things I wanna do when I want to.